Uh, next up, we have uh, Sophia Tainai. Uh, and uh, let me just, mm, yes, it is next is uh, Sophia. And uh, take it away, Sophia. Okay, I also have a presentation. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, let me know if you can't see this. Otherwise, I'll assume we're good. Um, Looks good. Okay. So yes, as uh, Professor Kalawit said, I am Sophia Tainai, and this is my capstone presentation on automating OKR analysis. A little bit of background on what that is. For the past two or three years, I've been working with the neuroscience lab at Carthage. Um, they, specifically with Dr. Stephen Henley, and where their research is focused on is with zebrafish. And I'm here to tell you that zebrafish are really cool. And there's a couple reasons why. One is that they're model organisms, uh, which just means that they are great for research um, because if for the zebrafish's case, they have a eye structure that's really similar to humans. So then we can research and test with them and see how it might affect humans. Another really cool thing about them is they have regenerative cut capabilities. And that means that they can regenerate parts of their body like their spine or their optic nerve, even into adulthood, which I'm sure you know humans can't really do that. Um, so it's a really cool thing that we're hoping to research and hopefully have humans at some point be able to do as well through research through these fish. Also, another cool thing is just that they're easier to take care of. This is why we use them for research. They take up less space, less food, and they have shorter lifespans, so we're not caring for them for 20 years. It's more like three to five years. Um, then a little bit more explanation. I said OKR in my title, and what that means is optokinetic response. Uh, I call it OKR for short because that's quite a mouthful, and um, this is important in the research as well. Uh, just what it is, it's this movement that our eyes do when we're tracking something and it just stabilizes the eye. There's two parts to it. There is uh, the smooth tracking and then the fast tracking or saccade. And um, I have this video here just to show you, but you can see in this video, there's this drum that's rotating, that's a stimulus. And if you see her eyes, they're kind of flicking a little bit. And so you'll see it's like a slow and then a quick flick of the eye when she's tracking. And um, this is similar to if you've ever just sat at the railroad tracks when, and watched the train going by and your eyes might have been following along and then snap back, follow along and snap back. That's that motion that we're talking about. This is the optokinetic response. And um, this is also uh, in fish as well. They are able to do this. I've been working on this project in different aspects for a few years now. This is a 3D um, model of a drum that I made, and I also 3D printed this. And you can see it here in the picture on the left. And inside that, you can see the paper has these stripes that are similar to the stimulus that you saw in that video of, of the woman. And this is then rotated by a stepper motor in the corner you see here. The fish is put in the center with the sponge. That's how it's um, held down there. And then we spin this around, and this is this experiment. And we have the microscope from above that is shining the light. It's also taking a video. And this is where I'm getting my data from. We have a video of fish as their eyes are being stimulated. Um, so why am I trying to track OKR? Well, it's kind of difficult to give a fish an eye exam. You and I can go to the doctor and just read off the charts here and they can communicate with us and see that, oh, our eyes um, are not doing so well, we need a prescription or something like that. But with fish, we can't. So we use OKR as a way to see how well their vision is. If a um, eye is damaged, then we know that it probably won't have this optokinetic response. And so we do this experiment over the time that the fish are regenerating their eyes, uh, which is about like two weeks or something like that. Um, it, and um, it's a good thing to measure because um, we don't learn it, we just kind of do it's a natural reflex. Um, and so that's a great way to measure it. How to put this into more numerical uh, data, you can see in the photos in the bottom here, I've got um, these axes across the eye, I've got the red and the green, and then there's that middle axis of the fish. And if we draw a perpendicular line from the axis of the eye, it creates this angle um, with the fish, and that's what I like to call the ocular angle. And if you plot this over time, we get a graph or a rep numerical representation of this data. Uh, and um, so right now, uh, 
how we do this, drawing the lines, um, there's some software out there for larval zebrafish, the younger ones, but it relies on the fish uh, and the fact that they're translucent at that time. But you can see in these pictures, the adult zebrafish are dark, they're, they're pigmented there. You can't use the software on them. So currently there is no software available to analyze them. So the process that Carthage used is going manually hand, like frame by frame and drawing in these lines and finding this information. As you can imagine, this would take a little bit of time. This is the data that you would actually see. This is data retrieved by this um, by hand model. It's a little bit hard to understand what's going on here, but in this little um, animation I made here, you can, it, it, what it's doing is this slow increase and then a quick step back, a slow increase and a quick step back. And that's again, that saccade movement in the OKR tracking. That's what we're looking for. Um, so this is confirmation you are seeing something. Uh, so like I mentioned, there is only uh, just this process of going by hand for adult zebrafish. So there's a need to make this process uh, not take as long because it's taking a really long time right now. To give you some pers perspective, uh, to have research and experiment with this, they were hoping to have that OKR that um, where the drum spins around a fish. They'd want to do that for 15 fish for 15 days over the regenerative process, which means we'd have a lot of video. I think it's like 225. And if it takes about eight hours to analyze this, it would be 1800 hours or 75 days, work days of um, analyzing. And that takes a really long time, which just isn't really feasible and doesn't make sense um, for this project. So, um, and that's currently what is happening right now. Uh, and that's where my senior thesis comes into play. I created a software that, uh, Automates, automates this process of analyzing. It's written in Python and I use several modules. I have OpenCV to manipulate the images and do simple processing of the images. And then I also used Scikit's Skimage module that has algorithms for further analysis of images. And with that, the images are treated as um, long arrays and so I need to have NumPy to manipulate those and work with those a little bit better and also Matplotlib for mathematically dealing with things and also graphing them um, because you are graphing your images. I also use TKinter for the interface, it's just a simple one. And so my initial plan of attack for this thesis was to learn about the modules that are available, see what I'm actually capable of, see if this is feasible, and then from there, determining my desired structure of what this is gonna look like. Um, if I'm going to have classes or what it's, how it's gonna work together, what's the process and how do I wanna involve the user. From there, I determined that I'm going to stick with just one frame right now, I'm not gonna worry about a whole video and extract the lines, those axes of the eyes and the angles um, and print that to a file. And what the hope is that once I can do it for one frame, well, then I can take it a step further and extract all this information for multiple frames strung together that are different. Um, and then once I had that, that would be the core of this project. And then just making a simpler interface that the students could work with um, to make it more accessible and not have to be uh, through the command line. So that first initial step, the actual core of the project, the single frame, is a conjunction of a few functions. One is, the first step is the, the canny edge detection. Canny is just a certain algorithm. There's a few out there, but I decided to go with this one. And it takes user input for a maximum value and a minimum value, and it does some math, and then it finds out what's probably the edges. And you can see in this photo here what it kind of guessed what the edges are. And you can, you can tell, like, that, that's a fish. Um, it's a little bit messy, but that, that doesn't actually matter. And then um, I figured that the image is a little bit too big to try and analyze all of that. I wanted to narrow down what I was actually interested in or determine a region of interest, ROI. And so I had the user on that first frame draw a rectangle around the eyes, and then I stored those coordinates for future use. So then I took that little square of region of interest along with the edge detection, and I fed it to another function from Scikit, Skimage's uh, module is called the hue line transform. And um, what this essentially does is it creates a bunch of random lines all over the image. I made it only do random lines that had angles from negative 45 and positive 45 about the y-axis, because I'm assuming that the fish is gonna be vertical like you see in these pictures here. 
And then from those random lines, it uses those white pixels from this edge detection here uh, to use as a voting sy system, essentially, that um, the more white pixels we have on that random line, the more probable that it is a line. Uh, so then it feeds me these long list of lines, and I still have too many of them, and I need a way to narrow it down to just these two. And not to get into all the math, because this was um, in polar coordinates, which I spent some time understanding how to retrieve the data I wanted from that coordinate system. It's just the extreme values. It's the maximum and minimum value from the origin. And so you can see the image here with the blue and the orange line. Uh, that is what the computer gave me. You can see that the orange is like pretty dead spot on. And then the blue is a little, it's a little off, but it's, it's there. It gets the idea. And we could even expect as humans that we'd have a little bit of error as we're manually finding um, these lines. So I've got a single frame and now I need to find a way to string them all together. This was more of a challenge than you would think it would be. Partially is because if you imagine I had that region of interest that was good for that frame, but the fish kind of wiggles around the video and I, I can't just keep using that same box. So I need a way to almost drag this box around with the fish so that I still have the correct region of interest that I'm looking for. How I decided to do this, or what I ended up doing, because I tried a few things, is using image segmentation with the watershed method. And um, what this is, is treating your image as a landscape, essentially. And with your landscape, you're flooding it with water. If you could imagine you have a mountain and a valley, you would have, and then you fill it up with water, you would eventually just see the peaks of the mountains and you would see what those um, edges are. And uh, so I do that with my image. The first image that you see in the top left corner is the markers, which is where I want my water to come from. And then I have my elevation map, which is what it determined from this image segmentation of um, what is kind of the edges of an object and what could be a whole thing. And from there, I'm able to find the objects and label them. It does it numerically. And so what I did is of all the objects in the image, I chose the one that had the most area that it covered in the image, assuming that that would be the fish, because everything else um, would just be like the little floaties in the water and the fish is kind of the only thing in focus. Um, so once I have that, I have the actual pixels designated in that area and I created a little algorithm just to find the topmost row of pixels and find that middle one. And I store that because it's a easier point to track than that box I was moving around and use it as a reference point. So I find the tip of the nose initially, I have what the user told me was the um, region of interest and I know how those relate to each other. So then for every frame, I update where the nose is and then in reference where that region of interest will go. Uh, so now I'd like to do a quick demo of the actual project. Hopefully my computer was struggling a little bit earlier. So I have a video in case, but it looks like it's working. So, um, you are able to browse from the computer to select the data that you actually want to put in. We select that. Then um, you can choose which eye you want to analyze because there are reasons for choosing a certain eye. For this one, we're going to be doing the left eye. And then you run the program. And this is the process of drawing your region of interest. We confirm that with the space. And then we can draw, uh, drag these track bars to find some values that we want. That looks good to me. I've been working on this a while, but essentially you kind of want a general idea of the fish and then the lines where the axes are. Confirm that. And then you can see this is the computer's um, guesses as to where the axis of the eye is. And you can tell um, that it sometimes flickers around, but generally speaking, it gets the idea of where this axis is and, um, and where the fish is looking at. You'll eventually wind up with data that looks like this, which is in a CSV that you can plug into um, Excel to analyze. Uh, so from there, oops, there we go. Um, this is a graph of the data that I received that um, is actually the one I showed you. And this is from Excel, this graph. And you can tell that there is a bit of a trend. There is a saccade movement. If you notice, it has this increase, it snaps back it increases, it kind of wiggles around a little bit there and then it snaps back. So you could look at this and see a trend and say, yes, there is a quality of vision here. The fish is looking around. Um, and so, like I mentioned before, um, there's an acceptable amount of ina inaccuracy because even humans would kind of mess around, especially as they're flying through trying to get one video done in eight hours. And so this 
uh, software works at about half the real time. And what that means is um, if the video that you're analyzing is about a minute long, it'll take 30 seconds or so to actually process it. So to put that in context, it was eight hours to analyze one video. Um, and now that would be about two and a half minutes. So those 75 days that you'd be working to analyze this, it would be about 9.4 hours, um, which is a significant benefit that would allow this, this experiment to continue to work. Some of the things that I learned with this project is working with real life data is hard. You have a lot of random things that you don't realize you have to worry about. Thankfully, I was able to work with um, a colleague of mine where I was working with lighting or the positioning of the fish or what restraints were being used on the fish and how they blocked the image. Um, but that's, it's something that you don't expect to, to deal with. But um, with that, it's also having some reasonable expectations with it that because you don't have a perfect world, you're not gonna have perfect results. Um, being reasonable in what you're actually capable of. It's tough to be a one-man team. I think that you could be, um, if you had a few more people that could, you know, focus in on something, you could really hone in these skills or, or whatnot to make this uh, software more um, complete. I also learned that trial and error is key. Um, I brushed over it a bit, but I spent a lot of time trying something, realizing it doesn't work, and then having to try something else. You would feel like you were banging your head against the wall, but you just had to keep doing it until you actually realized you knocked down that wall and you found a way to go through. Um, I also learned that you need to research a lot. You need to ask for help. Um, if you are um, stuck on something, ask for another person's uh, point of view, because sometimes you're just so in the thick of it that you can't see the obvious answer. Or even I just made the mistake of creating an entire function to do something and realize that there was already a pre-made one out there that I could have used. And I wasted some time in that. Also, actually, like Garrett mentioned, don't be afraid to scratch like a whole process because um, it's just not going to work sometimes. And you have to be OK giving up that work that you, you that you had done to find something that was better. Um, and so then with that is not being discouraged in it, because I know I found myself at times feeling like I was so far from the finish line when in reality, I was probably not too far away. So just staying encouraged, keep trying and doing that. And those were great um, life lessons to learn and I hope to bring into my future. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. And I wanted to thank um, Professor Henley and his guidance with the research, the entire CS Department for the Education and specifically Professor Kabalowitz and Professor Wheeler and their help with the thesis and understanding things. Also Ashley Hermans um, who works in the neuroscience lab and then my friends and family have supported me through it. If I have any questions, I'll take them. Please, questions for Sophia. Sophia, I have a question. Um, so the, the whole process of recording the fish, when it was a manual process, I understand the, you know, the setup was one way. So now that you're thinking about doing this more with software, I'm wondering, is there maybe a better way to set up the, the system you know, maybe light the fish differently or position the camera differently, maybe zoom or use a higher frame rate, something like that, so that you get a better edge detection. Do you think, have you thought anything about that, that it's no longer a manual process, it's done in software and what could we do to sort of change the equipment or change the experiment? Yeah, actually there has been some updates that we did. If you noticed in one of the initial photos that I showed, um, I could go back to it, um, where this image right here was really dark um, and you can't get any sort of information from that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so eventually I did work with Ashley to create a better lighting. This is one that has um, better lighting here. And so working with that, just figuring out which actual way of lighting is good, whether it be top down or bottom up, um, just finding that and it was experimenting with it. I think there is further work to do in that. And so I am actually hoping that this is something that they can experiment with as they um, try out their software uh, to see what lighting works best. But generally speaking, it seems like top down seems to be the best because you get a little bit more detail in that um, eye. And it also has less focus than on the background, which isn't important. You can see in this photo that you can see like random letters and, and things like that. I don't know, how uh, how wiggly are these guys? Could you zoom in more? <laughs> 
they're wiggly um because they're alive they're just being held down in a sponge um so they like to wiggle their heads and they actually shift around a bit so um i wouldn't want to zoom in too much there might be some um that you could zoom but i would think probably not too much and they're also in a tiny little dish so it it just makes it difficult to try and restrain them and then last question uh, did you compare um, maybe a video that somebody looked at manually and recorded, and then you run it through your software and see how close the software was to the manual uh, examination? Yeah, I wish I could have done that, but the problem is, is the lighting was uh, both terrible and that information wasn't really available anymore. Um, so I was not able to compare it, but I was able to kind of confirm through those lines that it was, and then also through the graph that it, it was showing what we needed to know. So obviously, uh, your project comes down to uh, this edge detection and being able to determine where the fish is looking. Uh, what was what was the process of realizing this is what you needed to do did you know from the very beginning that edge detection this is what i need to uh, solve this problem no that is a very good question um, like i said i had to do a lot of research initially on what can i even do i'd never even opened an image before with some uh, program or with code or anything so that was quite the experience for me uh, honestly it spent a lot of time initially just um knowing that I need to probably use OpenCV because that was one of the only things out there for like good structured, um, like there's documentation for it. So I just spent some time looking through different functions and then uh, messing around with it. I was tossing around using um, morphological operations and different things like that. Um, but then uh, the suspicion was, um, I threw it into an edge detection, realized that the axes of the eyes were still kept there and thought, I wonder if I could find a way to have the computer understand that that's a line there. Because as humans, that's something that we can really readily see. It was quite obvious to me and my um, leading professor in the research. Um, so that was the thought process there. So Sophia, you're at uh, half real time. Uh, do you think maybe if, uh, what kind of penalty do you think you're paying for using an interpreted language like Python? Um, that is a good question. I would, I mean, it's probably easy to say that I am um, moving slower than I could if I were to do something that was not like Python. Um, I think there's a lot of inefficiencies in the software. Um, one being, if I think of, even this um, watershed method um, to find um, which you know row I was looking for, I had to go through every um, row until that. So it's inefficient in that way. I think there are ways to speed up the process. Um, so um, do I think that I'm losing or you know I'm gaining time in that processing time because of it? Um, yes, um, but. I would say for me, working on that solo, Python was a good balance between actually being able to do the work and having that processing power. Okay, so, uh, some other questions for Sophia? You mentioned that real life data is hard and that it's messy. I guess what parts of this data were particularly difficult um, as you went through this project? Yeah, well, kind of what we talked about before with lighting and background, uh, I did find that um, there was like little floaties in the, in the videos or there was, um, you can actually see in these images here, there's this random white or yellow line here. And that is actually a needle that is used to restrain the fish. So there's a sponge and then they have little needles poked on either side to keep this closed. And uh, that would get in the way. And um, so, and it's very line-like. So I don't want that to be in my process. And that's why I had to zero in with that region of interest. Uh, so that was an issue. I was talking with the lab and just talking about maybe using a white 
needle because the needles are black and the fish tend to look black in the images. Um, so working with them to make the data a little bit more um, usable. Well, how about a uh, big round? Big round. Sure. Let your emojis fly. Well done, Sophia. And uh, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, working with you, knowing you. Um, let's see, we started out together in 1810. Is that right? Was I your no, first? No. Nope. I had the odd, oddball one where CS1 and 2 was joined together. So I had you for oh. CS2, I think. OK. <laughs> was uh, that was an interesting year, but it's always been an absolute pleasure having you in class. I'm gonna miss you. And um, uh, do, you, do you have any ideas of what you'll be doing next? Uh, at the moment, I'm applying for jobs. The goal is, as you can tell, I like to work with people that um, are in like the biology or neuroscience department. So I've tossed around um, looking for labs like that that need some of that software help because um, I really enjoy the collaboration with those um, people. So 